Good morning, friends. There have been so many painful things about COVID-19, haven't there? But one of the good things that has come out of this is that more people are praying. Not just one or two more people, a massive one-third of the population are praying more. I quote from the Sydney Morning Herald, Researchers have found Australians say they have been praying more during the COVID-19 crisis, suggesting the pandemic has led many to reassess their priorities in life. That's amazing. We're constantly being told in the newspapers that people have given up on God. But here is a newspaper article reporting that one third of our population are praying more. That's 8 million Australians calling upon God more than they were before. And it makes sense at a time like this, doesn't it? COVID-19 has reminded us that we're fragile, that we're not in control, that sickness is real and that death is coming. So to pray, to cry out to God, Well, in a time like this, it's entirely rational and sensible. That's really encouraging news, isn't it, friends? But at the same time, I feel discouraged in prayer as well. I'm discouraged in how hard Christian prayer sometimes seems to be. I'm discouraged in, in how little we as Christians seem to pray. See, that newspaper article reporting that 8 million people are praying more, it is encouraging, but I'm not sure what a lot of that prayer is. And I'm very sure that a lot of it isn't true Christian prayer to the true God. But we know the true God, the true and living God. We know him as our Father in heaven. We of all people should delight to pray. We, Christian friends, should rush to God in prayer, particularly at a time like this, a global pandemic. And yet prayer can seem so hard. It can seem like it's the last thing that we get to. It seems to me that we're often slow to pray as Christians. And if we do, it feels like a duty or even a burden And I wonder why that is. Why don't we as Christians delight to pray? And friends, what I suspect it is, is that we don't know our God well enough. See, I think the extent to which we pray to God and enjoy praying to God says something about how well we know our God. I'm excited, friends. We're going to spend three weeks talking about prayer from the Bible. And we're going to start today by getting to know our God better. For that is where all true prayer is founded. It's founded on the knowledge of who God is. Friends, as we begin this series on prayer, let's pray. Let me lead us. Father God, we thank you so much that we can pray to you. Uh, May we rejoice to learn more about who you are and what it means that we can ask you for things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, how you pray depends on how you understand what God is like. There are a whole lot of different types of prayer, aren't there? But true biblical prayer is founded on the true biblical revelation of who God is. Now, there's a lot that we could say about this, isn't there? But I've got five points today, friends. Five points that we're going to look at together. God is personal. God is powerful. God is a father. God is holy. God is merciful. First, God is a person. God is not a robot. He's not a machine. He's not a force. God is a person, and we're persons as well, made in his image, 
made for a relationship with him. Genesis 1.27, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So God and people speak and listen to each other. This personal God speaks to us in words, the words of Scripture, and supremely in the Word become flesh the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this personal God listens to us as we speak to him in return. Prayer is founded on the fact that God is personal. See, if God is a force, an it, not a him, if God is a force like the force in Star Wars, well, you align yourself with it, don't you? You tune into it. You feel the force. But the God of the Bible is not a force. He's personal. And so we talk to him. Friends, prayer is speaking to God. More than that, prayer is speaking words to God to ask him for things. That's what prayer means in the Bible. It is always Asking things from God. Prayer isn't thanking God or praising God. As important as those things are. We saw that last week, didn't we, with Psalm 145. No, we are to thank God for things. In fact, almost always when we're invited to pray, we're invited to pray with thanksgiving. But that's because thanksgiving is something separate. Prayer is asking God for things. So that's what prayer is, friends. Speaking words to our personal God to ask him for things. And that is a very sensible thing to do. Because not only is God personal so that he listens to our words, God is powerful to answer our prayers. God is personal and God is powerful. You see this so clearly in the contest between the prophets of Baal and Elijah in 1 Kings 18. Elijah, the prophet of God, lines himself up against the prophets of Baal to test who the true God is. Is it Yahweh, the God of Israel, or is it Baal? Elijah prepares the test. The prophets of Baal on one hand, Elijah on the other hand, are each to prepare a sacrifice. If Baal lights their sacrifice, Baal is the true God. If Elijah's God lights his sacrifice, Elijah's God is the true God. The prophets of Baal go first for 12 hours, for the whole day. They try everything to get Baal to light the altar. They cry to him. He doesn't hear. They cry louder, they scream, they shout, they dance around the altar, they cut themselves until they're bleeding. But there's nothing, only silence. Elijah prays, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. With that, fire from heaven engulfs his sacrifice. Baal doesn't exist, which is why there is silence when he's prayed to. Baal doesn't exist except as an idol created by the imagination of man. But the true and living God does exist. And because he's personal, he hears. And because he's powerful, he is able to answer the prayers of his people. God is powerful to answer prayer. God is able to do anything and everything. 
There is no limit to what God can do. We've been learning about this in our growth teams, haven't we, friends, in our two ways to live gospel presentation. It begins with this knowledge of God as the powerful creator of all the world, the ruler of the world who made the world and who made us to rule under him. There would be no point praying to this God if he couldn't do anything. That would be a foolish waste of time. But if God is powerful, then it would be totally foolish to not pray to God. And God is powerful. He's powerful over everyone and over everything. And it's not as though God just created the world and then set it in motion, leaving it to go where it would, kind of like one of those wind-up toys that a child will release to charge off in some random direction. No, friends. God not only created the world, God sustains the world. He keeps it going in every way. God is in total control of every event and circumstance of our world, big and small, in every moment. So God is able to answer our prayers. As Jeremiah prayed, Ah, Lord God, it is you who has made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. As Jesus prayed, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. God is the all-powerful creator, king. So pray to him. Ask him for things. Things big and things small. Can God give you a car park when you're driving around in the shopping center car park? Yes, he can. Ask him for one. Can God send fine weather for your picnic? Yes, pray for it. Can God heal your mother's cancer? Yes, ask him to. Can God end COVID-19 with a vaccine? Yes, pray for one. Can God end COVID-19 without a vaccine? Absolutely, in a moment. Ask him to. Can God save you from your sins? Yes. Can God save your unbelieving family member or friend? Yes. Can God bring a great Christian revival in our area, in our lifetime? Sure. Ask him to. Friends, pray big prayers. Our God is powerful. He is able to answer them. What have we seen, friends? God is personal. He hears our prayers. God is powerful. He is able to answer our prayers. And God is good. For God is Father. Father to all he has made. And that is a wonderful reason to rush to God in prayer. God is Father over creation. See, God isn't just powerful. He's powerful and good. Idi Amin was the powerful ruler of Uganda. He was powerful, but he wasn't good. Idi Amin was a mass murderer of his own people. He was terrifying. He was not someone that you would come near to. You would stay right away from him. But that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is powerful and good as father to all that he has made. I'm very blessed, friends. I was born into a wonderful family with a wonderful father. Some of you, I know, haven't had that experience. And that has been unbelievably painful for you. And the reason it's been painful is that Deep down, we all have some sense of what good fatherhood is meant to look like. For of all the people in the world, 
Our Father is the one who is meant to protect us and to provide for us. To use their power for good in our lives. And so when that doesn't happen, it's deeply traumatic. But friends, whatever experience you have had with your human father, this father, God the Father, never lets anyone down. He never hurts anyone with his power. God is kind and caring to all that he has made. Psalm 104 is worth reflecting on here, friends. It shows us that God is Father over all of creation. He sends the wind. He makes grass grow for the cattle. He feeds the wild lions. He brings each night and he brings each day. He gives the breath of life to every creature who lives. God is good, friends. God protects and provides for all that he has made, even his enemies. As Jesus says to his followers, your Father in heaven causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. The God of the Bible is a good Father over all of his creation. So here's some reasons to pray, friends. God is personal. God is powerful. God is a father. So does that mean that that anyone can approach God and ask him for things and expect that he will listen? Well, no, friends. For if God is a father to all that he has made, people are rebellious sons who have turned their back on the family home. And that's our great problem with prayer. We've broken our relationship with God the Father. We've broken the relationship in our rebellion. See, we've seen that we're like God, for God is a person and we are persons, so that we can relate to God through speaking and listening. But we're unlike God in one very big way. God is holy and we're not. To be holy is to be separate, other, different. And God is separate and other and different to us in his absolute perfection and purity. But we have all turned away from God. We've turned away in rebellion. So we can't approach God in prayer. Not because of a problem on his side, but because of a problem on our side. Our evil is a great problem to God, who is too pure to look upon evil. As God said to Israel through the prophet Isaiah, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So what hope is there? What hope is there for prayer? Yes, God is holy, but God is merciful. So God sent his son, Jesus Christ, the eternal son of the eternal father, into our world so that we might be adopted into God's family as his children. Jesus would always start his prayers to God, Abba, Father. Abba means something more intimate than Father, but more respectful than Daddy, something like Dad. And Jesus prayed to his Dad, his Abba, Father in heaven, And his prayers were heard and answered. Except for one. Which is amazing. Which prayer of Jesus, the perfect eternal son of the father, would go unanswered? It was the prayer Jesus prayed on the night before he died on the cross. 
a prayer he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. Jesus' cup meant the cross on which he would die, taking the full force of God's anger, which we deserved for our rebellion. Jesus was about to die for our sins, but he was asking his Father if there was another way, some other way for us to be made God's children. But there wasn't. For that's how serious our rebellion is. It would cost the life of God's own dear son, Jesus, for us to be forgiven for our sins and made sons and daughters of God. So that first part of Jesus' prayer wasn't answered, at least not with a yes. For Jesus went to the cross, which was God's will. And so it was Jesus' will as well. And so the second part of Jesus' prayer was answered. And on that cross, Jesus died for you and for me, so that we too might call God our Abba, Father, Dad in heaven. The Apostle Paul puts all of this together in a couple of verses in Galatians. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So yes, friends, God is a father in a general sense to all that he has made. But he only becomes our father, my father, in a personal sense as we come to Jesus, the son of God, and are born again to new life by the spirit of God. And friends, that is the beauty and the basis of prayer. The most famous prayer of all, the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught his followers to pray, begins with what might be the two most beautiful words in the whole of the Bible. Our Father. Not just Father, and not the Father, but our Father, our Father in heaven. For God sent his Son into the world to make this possible. Do you pray like that, friend? Do you know this relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ in the power of the Spirit so that you pray to God? Our Father in heaven, my Father in heaven. I love praying out loud together with Goodson from our Auburn Church, which I do from time to time. Goodson fills his prayers to God with the address, O oh my Father, O oh my Father. It's the beautiful cry of someone who knows that they are a child of God. Do you pray like that, friend? My Father in heaven, our Father in heaven. The only way you can is if God has become your Father through Jesus, the Son of God. Now that you have been born again to new life by the Spirit of God. Has that happened for you? If it hasn't, may I invite you to pray to become God's child today. 
It's a very simple prayer. Jesus gave an example in Luke's gospel, just seven words long. God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And Jesus told the story that that man who prayed that prayer went home, friends, a child of God. Pray that prayer, friend. And if you do, please let me know that I can, so that I can help you understand what an amazing thing has just happened once you have prayed that prayer. You have become a child of God. Christian friends, we who know God as our Father in heaven, we who know God as the personal God who speaks and who listens, we who know God who is powerful, who is Father over all of creation, who is holy and yet merciful, so that he has now become our Father. Do we pray? Friends, if we know this God is our God, we will pray. Not just during COVID-19. We will pray at all times, for all things, big and small. Prayer won't be a duty. It will be a delight. You won't be thinking to yourself things like, I really should pray more. You won't be thinking, I really should go to that prayer meeting. You'll be thinking, amazing. I get to pray to God, my Father. You'll be thinking to yourself, praise God. My heavenly dad who loves me, who gave his son for me, that I might be a son or daughter of his. He wants me to ask him for things. Wow. You'll pray, friend. And you will delight to pray. Friends, Jesus God's eternal son, Jesus, our brother in the gospel, invites us to pray. He invites us to enjoy this extraordinary blessing and privilege of prayer. I'm going to close with his words. Listen to his invitation. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him?